Hi there everyone, how's it going? Uh, hopefully you're doing well today. Today we're going to cover in this video lecture your QMD part two, so the second part, your systematic observation strategy, as well as what you're going to do for your, your own research proje projects and coming up with a, a uh, cl data collection plan. So there's a lot of parallels between the two, so <clears throat> we'll cover both today. Um, yeah, uh, before, just a very brief, uh, before we get there, I'd like to go back and show you where we're at and where we're headed. So again, um, where, where you got your lab due today, I'm sure you're aware, but we'll, we'll cover part two, uh, next week you're back in the lab collecting some, uh, kinetic data <clears throat> and your second assignment is due at the end of that week on, on the ninth. So um, again, the second assignment, as you'll see, we'll keep referring back to uh, critical features, and that's probably one of the most important components of your uh, lit reviews and academic research is looking for support for your uh, critical features and what you're going to look for, which, as you'll come to find out from today's lecture, will define uh, what you're looking for once you get into the lab. Okay. So that's a really big key feature there. Uh, for part three and four, uh, we'll cover that uh, the week after, uh, and then you're, you're off for a reading break uh, with your lab submit, okay? Uh, again, keeping in mind that once we're back from break, you'll do your final lab, so you'll get your last chance to integrate knowledge on how to perform uh, the third of the big three uh, components that you need to consider to analyze or, or measure when looking at, at data and uh, human movement, sorry. And um, that will be your kind of uh, big kickoff uh, once we finish your observation plan or data collection plan. Um, that's kind of the, the final bit of information you could possibly need uh, before you get into your data collection. That being said, if you get your data collection done soon, um, you know, uh, your, your lab, uh, Ryan, is very open for you to be able to try to schedule in some lab time sooner than later um, to be able to collect that data and you can move your project forward a little bit quicker a little sooner uh, okay uh, last uh, and kind of the new feature on this point is March 9th I managed to get a guest speaker uh, a friend of mine who works at EA games in the mocap or motion capture department um, set me up with their biomechanist. So she's going to come in and she'll speak to us about how she collects um, uh, motion capture data and, and, and different metrics as a biomechanist that works for a video game or a software company and her role there. But she's also got some great experience as a um, uh, in the clinical sides of bio biomechanism uh, or being a biomechanist. And she can uh, speak to that a little bit as well. So if your project is kind of, uh, I think you'll just gain gain good experience and knowledge uh, from her and you can pick her brain as far as her line of work. Um, should be a, a fun chat for sure. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with that, let's, um, let's get into things here. Let's uh, pull up the pointer, perfect. Okay. So as a review, where are we right now? Well, you've done your qualitative research. Again, from what I've seen, looks great. You're in the process of doing your lit review. Now those two things in particular directly feed into your critical feature identification, uh, figuring out what they are, how to do them. We went through that good uh, group activity as a class last day um, to help you figure that out. Uh, we, we had a previous lecture um, specified on critical features. So if you're still unsure about what you're looking for, how to figure out a critical feature, etc., cetera, uh, go back, review, review the lecture, uh, and there will be another uh, thing that you can consider towards the end of this lecture that should be helpful as well. Okay. From that, that will give you what you need to develop your intake form for step one of your QMD. Uh, and we covered that previously. So today, now, next step, we're going to figure out, we're going to come up with a plan and, and you're going to be able to determine what you need to do for this plan for data collection. Okay. When you get in the lab, what are you going to do? 
good question. Uh, let's give you the tools you need to to figure that out and, and plan for that, okay? And again, there's a lot of parallels with step two. They're different. Again, remember the QMD is more the, the actual manual or guide that you'd want to give a coach or a movement practitioner. Uh, this component here is just your overall IMEG research project and, and um, will be a component of that that's submitted separately or, or um, not as, as part of your QMD, okay? Okay, so here we are, data collection methods and figuring out the QMD uh, systematic observation strategy. Okay. So that falls into this component here. We've done our prep, we got our intake form, we're gonna figure out how do we want coaches, movement specialists, observing movement. Okay, great. So that's called, if you see SOS, that's what it's uh, abbreviated for, Systematic Observation Strategy. Uh, we're gonna take a peek at so, a couple existing models that are out there. We can use them as examples or um, you know, kind of a, a, a standard to, to compare our or your own um, models of, of your SOS to. And then you're gonna develop, and more specifically, we'll figure out how to develop your systematic observation strategy uh, a few considerations beyond just having a, a model to follow, as well as uh, re, uh, affirming and summarizing what key elements are for the SOS. And then once we've done all of that, because that gives us a lot of uh, foundation for our chat or uh, our step-by-step -step guide for you for your data collection plan. Okay, great. So our SOS, what is that? How does that work? Why are we doing it? Okay. Um, at, at first glance, it might seem a bit obvious or a bit basic to try to uh, state how a coach should watch a, a motor skill or, or a movement specialist. And at the end of the day, um, there's, there's a little bit more to it. You know, uh, the main reason why, and it's the same reason we're doing the whole QMD or, or IMAKE project in the first place, is to try to eliminate human error or bias. Okay, so we want to come up with, it says it right in the word, systematic strategies, right? So um, one of the ways we can do this is figuring out our critical features. If I, if I haven't driven that home enough, this is a very important component of your QMD. Is, is keying in on that. And, uh, and that, again, allows, allows us to come up with a, um, an, a way to help eliminate uh, bias or human error in, in our models and our, our coaching or movement assessments. Yeah. So uh, there's general components of a systematic observation strategy. You'll see as we get into it how it might vary depending on on the sport or clinical setting that you're in, but ultimately they kind of they have more or less a couple of components. One is the observation stage, uh, and again, this is where we're trying to queue up our movement specialists to observe, gather, uh, and and just really almost take a, a photograph without judgment or biases of the movement or, or video in our minds how how it happens. Okay. And this is tricky, you know, again, if, on the surface level, this might seem pretty straightforward, but if you start thinking about all the different sensory that we get either in say an arena or a stadium or on, on a soccer pitch, you know, uh, coaches are inundated with different sensory information and, um, and, and that can cause uh, bias or, or uh, latency or, uh, delays in being able to gather and, and process, uh, get the, the information we need from our observations. <clears throat> okay, the other components or other essential aspects is when and what to focus on. And again, if we get a very systematic scientific approach to identifying critical features, that gives us a direction to where to look for our observation. And, uh, one of the models coming up uh, addresses attention, and we'll, we'll speak about it then. Uh, as well as, um, how do you, like, what, what is the best place, uh, method, approach to observing for, uh, for a certain sport or skill or, or, or a movement in a, in a setting? 
what do I mean by that? Well, uh, for example, observing how someone swims in a pool is going to be very, very different than uh, watching a uh, archer uh, practice their sport. Right. So there's definitely different approaches and different uh, ways to go about uh, figuring out what the best strategy for observing a movement is. Okay. Let's take a look at existing models. Now, this one is, is pretty good in the sense that it, it covers some components that people don't always uh, consider. So you've probably, I've shown this a couple of times now, and the idea again is similar to the discussion when I was talking about how experts form uh, constellations or these these general um, feelings and senses and pictures in their minds of what movement looks like or what they're trying to do. Uh, I used the example previously in medicine. So physicians, when they're trying to make a diagnosis, they just get a sense of a few key features that are just kind of apparent before they make their diagnosis. And uh, experts versus novices have a, a clear constellation or, or idea. The, the word here for, for movement is called uh, just salt, and the idea is it's just like a sense or a, an, an image of the whole movement, okay? So one of the key aspects of this first model, the reason I give you that background knowledge is uh, attention. So in order for an observer to actually observe something, they need to be paying attention to it, and, and that's pretty key. And so uh, again, having this overall feeling for the entire movement uh, is necessary. Okay. The next part is having a bit of a template to work from. So if as a movement specialist, you've never observed a certain movement before, uh, you might not have that template in your mind, okay? And, and ultimately, developing one uh, will help you, uh, again, hone in on critical features, but also in your mind's eye or your coaching eye, have this uh, range of correctness that that uh, is within allowable parameters before you know you want to intervene and, and maybe change something and last but not least uh, motivation so this has a little bit to do with uh, attention but it's more it more applies to uh, the the uh, practitioner who's who's the movement specialist so the the way uh, Radford here describes motivation is uh, there must be persistent motivation to attend to the skill for throughout the duration and to be able to see all all the key features uh, that are present. That's pretty much it. And it takes time and effort and practice to, to do, of course. Um, yeah, the next model that we're going to cover uh, it should it, it draws a lot of parallels to your QMD in general. And so I think it's a really great place to start when you're trying to develop and come up with your own model or 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 use use um, um, one of these models uh, to explain how you want your coaches for your motor skill to watch okay okay so in this there's seven steps uh, uh, the number four to through seven is kind of one one multi-step together but uh, it starts off where you know you want to have your prep preparation before you observe the skill and so that's classifying the fund fundamental movement patterns or the mechanical objective of the skill that you're looking at. Uh, so that's your biomechanic component. And then you divide the movement into phases. And I used uh, Speed Skater here because I think it's, it's kind of interesting to see how you can uh, divide a movement, you know, just looking at the left skate or the right skate um, and, and kind of what's going on uh, in between. Um, Try not to confuse the seven phases here with the seven steps it's talking about uh, in the James and Dufek model. It's a little different. And we, we've spoken about both of these already, right? We've, we've done this in previous classes. So preparation phase, great. Observation, well, that's what we're here to talk about today. So they, they suggest that you observe several times to evaluate each phase critically. And so that's kind of a new thing that we haven't really spoken about yet, is how many times do we watch something? So we'll come back to that a bit later. But the main component here now in the observation model that I want to draw your attention to 
is four major areas and it's a sequential order as to how you should watch a movement okay so i have a gift here um just to scooch back so uh you know you kind of have this general photo strobe going on and talking about different uh, forces uh, being applied but that's less important when you just want to start out and that's what you want the you to communicate with your coaches so the order that the James and Dufek model suggests that they watch movements is is one just a total body rhythm and continuity and uh, again kind of going like big picture what does the movement look like generally speaking okay what are our major things that you can kind of notice and the easiest to just look at the whole body so when we're looking at the speed skater we can see um, a few things as far as the rhythm, right? There's a natural rhythm between left and right sides. There's this flow, there's continuity and repetition between that movement. And so already we can start observing certain things about this movement, okay? If any of that rhythmicity between left and right sides wasn't there, that might be a point for intervention, okay? So number two, you know, you start moving towards the trunk, the pelvis, looking at the center of gravity. So you could talk about uh, balance or shifting a weight here. Uh, and, and again, looking more at the larger muscle groups. And we spoke about this last day, right? What are, the, what are the main kind of ideas behind the kinematic chain? Well, it's this, right? Going from larger muscle groups in the core, uh, so more medial, and, and then going towards the periphery as far as uh, how movement is generated. And sure enough, um, once we start talking about center of gravity and shifts of weight, we can talk about exactly that, changes in base support. And last but not least, uh, specific uh, extremity actions. So a good example of this um, that I can think of would be, uh, we could use speed skating, but I'm gonna use swimming. So as you swim, uh, and there's a little bit of contention around this, but uh, you know, there's a couple of, of um, style preferences potentially that you could say where one one school of thought is you want to extend the path across your body in the swim stroke so again if i'm facing down in the water put my arm in i swim stroke through make this kind of like s shape um and then uh, i can even talk about right to the very end where i want to almost paddle through with my hand okay Conversely, other people say you want to uh, keep the elbow at 90 degrees, kind of pull through like a paddle, um, and then keep a fixed uh, wrist as you go to push through. You even talk about the ideal distance as to how wide your fingers are. You know, uh, this isn't as good, that's not as good, but something very close to the middle is generally ideal. Okay, so again, you can get quite uh, out to the extremities, li literally to fingertips um, for that. Uh, another brief example would be golf. So when you're talking about golf, the, the specific extremity actions would be even the angle of the golf club head, okay? Okay, so again, the general focus order from, from big picture, more and more narrow. Okay, that's the observation plan that this model is built on. So the key points here, I just want to reiterate and summarize one last time, systematic, systematic. So you have a plan with, with strategy built in there and it's a model. So what that means is, um, you know, you have this structure that you want coaches to follow. Okay. The key elements were phases of movement, balance, and that came up in a couple of different ways really keying in on critical features that's the third thing and then last but not least is a path of general impressions to specific um, uh, movements for observation okay and that can look these models can can look a few different ways depending on your motor skill that you've chosen okay okay so moving forward now <laughs> you know like that was that's what's previously been done um, you can model your models off of that you can generate your own uh, loosely based on them but again of course always reference anything that you uh, are pulling from or, or using any ideas that aren't your own right uh, but let's get into how you're going to develop your own systematic observation strategy for um, for your your coaching model for your QMD okay so and the first stop is going beyond the model 
So we have these ideas of these models. You'll come up with your own, but uh, in the process of doing so, there's other components that uh, you should probably consider. And one of them is field of view. So you want to be specific about um, how uh, you actually want your coaches to be able to frame or view the action occurring. Okay, so a, a good example of this, and I'll, I'll give you two before we get into some details, is is literally just this camera work here at a football game. Okay, so if you're wanting uh, your coach to view a specific skill, let's say uh, throw by a quarterback, and you have the camera way up in the crowd, way up in the back, well, yeah, you're going to have a huge field of view, but you're going to have too much information in there. And the information you want, let's say the quarterback's actual throw, is going to be quite small and it'll be hard to differentiate different limb, limb segments moving and um, potentially timing and you know players might get in the way, etc. So depending on what your setup is for your motor skill, your field of view ideally is probably a little bit more focused in and keyed in onto your mover, whoever that is. So in this case, uh, a, a quarterback. And, you know, ideally for, in my mind, for the field of view for a quarterback, you want to get in close enough where uh, maybe in a practice scenario where you can see full full torso length. Not only that, you probably want to be uh, zoomed out or backed out a bit so that you can get enough of, let's say, the setup. So from the, from the hike, a few steps back, um, a step forward for the throw without having to adjust your frame, right? So you want to be able, be able to capture the whole movement uh, through all phases uh, with one frame shot, okay? Without getting too much extraneous inf information in there. So that example has distance and vantage point, you know, included. I think being on the field versus in the stands would be a lot better for that example. Different parts of the body and view and frame. Yeah, we want to see the whole body for a throw. You know, if, if a motor skill is just upper body, we probably don't need to see lower body, right? Uh, it's different for a camera versus a person as well. And that's something that you'll want to clarify in your observation, uh, uh, systematic ob observation strategy, because some of you will, will necessitate having a, a camera uh, or a video for it, others won't. And so depending on that, you'll have to determine uh, all, all of these as well. Last but not least, context of the observation. So is it a practice or a game? Right? So when determining your field of view or what you want your coaches to have, all of these are really, really important components. Okay, that makes sense. Now, number of observations. So I mentioned this earlier. We'll talk about it now. So the number will vary depending on, and, and this is how many trials you want your coaches to actually observe when they're trying to use their, their QMD model to assess a motor skill. Okay, just to re remind you of the context here. So, you know, you might initially just think, well, do as many as you feel is necessary. Well, that's not very specific. That's not a good strategy, right? A strategy gives a little bit more specificity. And, you know, maybe you want to say, well, let's do 100 then, because that's great, because then you see 100 trials, you get a really good impression of what's going on. Well, maybe, but I would suggest probably not. And the reasons are, um, with something like using 100 is the fatigue level might creep in and start changing the way the performer performs their motor skill, right? So that's one thing to consider. Another would be the complexity of the skill. So typically, if a, a skill is a bit more complex, there's more involved, that can A, you know, fatigue out the, the performer or the person performing the skill, uh, but it can also lead to greater variation between trials. So maybe in that case, you do need a few more, okay? Uh, developmental capacity of the mover. Well, that's, uh, you know, speaking to motor development. So that point in consideration is, uh, is this a, a child, a teen, an adult? Is this an older adult that you're trying to observe the skill with? So the number of times you get the person to do that will, will definitely affect how, how they move. And also safety of the performer, okay? So if, uh, you know, the, the fatigue is setting in, um, you know, my mind's going to an example of a, a older adult in a clinical setting where you're trying to get them to demonstrate a certain movement. 
uh, but their capacity just isn't quite there to do so. So that could be a new mover or someone, again, who's not as able-bodied. Um, you want to keep those in mind as far as how many trials you try to get someone to do. Okay. And obviously those that are a bit more skilled and proficient at a skill can typically perform a skill more often than someone who is a new mover, right? Um, and that's largely because they've learned how to become efficient and effective with their movements. Right? So the general suggested range is anywhere from like three to five repetitions or trials, if you will, uh, over two to three sets, obviously taking breaks in between those as needed. But uh, the, 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 the kind of average across all uh, research and, and this would be about five trials, okay? And if, I, you know, if you think about this, and if you were to try, um, say, a new exercise or a motor skill, five is pretty good. You know, the first two you kind of use as a warm-up. You, you hone in on your skills a little bit, and then you get about two or three really good trials. And then after that, typically, you know, sometimes you'll start to see your, your trial performance drop off a little bit. Now, again, this will vary depending on the motor skill that you're trying to observe and the context you want to see it for. Some motor skills, for example, in endurance sport require a lot of repetition. So if you're running for hours and hours on end, potentially it's going to be best to uh, have the the participant or the mover run for a certain amount of time and then take a a um, section or a sample of running while they're fatigued maybe that's partly what you're looking for okay so again this isn't hard and fast rules but generally speaking they're really great guides okay so we, we spoke about uh, how we want to frame or be able to have our field of view, either as a coach or a camera, to see a motor skill done. We've spoken about uh, how many trials we want to see someone do these uh, skills. But what if we just need more time to view the movement in different ways? Well, what do I mean by that? Well, extended observation is a way using video or, or photography to essentially either slow down the movement or, or use freeze frames to be able to analyze different movements that we might not normally be able to see uh, with the naked eye, right? So, what, uh, you know, we, it allows for observation of, of that information that we would normally be able to see. Uh, and here's, here's a photo by uh, Harold Edgerton. Uh, he he kind of pioneered uh, slow motion photography and f a few different aspects of photography, like the digital flash bulb, I believe, and, and aspects like that. But he, um, but we can we can kind of start to see how, you know, at different points and phases in this uh, tennis serve, we might not be able to actually have seen where the ball hit the tennis racket, you know. And there's little little things like that that potentially could be really important to your movement that uh, again just happened too quick and so that's typically when we look to use extended observation is when there's fast movements so th there's things that we wouldn't normally be able to see or there's fine motor skills again that just might happen in a way where we would be able to capture them normally as a as a, an observer so keeping that in <clears throat> keeping that in mind if you have a motor skill that happens at a, a fairly high velocity in your systematic observation plan you should probably include something that uh, allows for extended observation okay okay ah yes hopefully this works okay so um one last component to tie in some of our, our qualitative research to this is in including the the mover or the performer's input into the systematic observation plan. Again, depends on the movement and, and uh, what level of athletes you're dealing with or, or movers. But, excuse me, at some point in time in the SOS, you can include uh, getting feedback from the performer. Now, that's obviously after the movement's been done. But usually that's only useful with elite athletes and or athletes that uh, are, are um, have really good body awareness. 
one of the sports that allows for you to do that is gymnastics. So here is a motor skill being completed by a gymnast, Ri Zhang Song. And I believe it is a backflip, maybe double backflip. with rotation, right? So just phenomenal athleticism. I hope they uh, show a side view here again. So when you're watching someone like this move, it becomes pretty apparent that they probably have a great idea where their body is in space and time, right? Oh, let's go back. Okay. Just phenomenal. I'll let it play. It's, it's, it's so intriguing. Um, yeah, whereas, so if we compare this with new movers, they, they won't have that same capacity to identify uh, where they are in space and time. Right? And so again, sports like gymnastics, phenomenal for this. So even when they go to, tr uh, gymnasts go to try new sports, oftentimes because they have that kinesthetic awareness that body awareness they they tend to pick up on um, other activities and other sports quite readily uh, so very similarly with dancers dancers have great body awareness okay so uh, typically when you're trying to and again you can include this in your intake form but include information as far as specialization into a certain motorsport uh, before you get feedback um, trying to figure out whether your mover's skill has transference or not is important, okay? Um, uh, so for example, it's up to you to determine and, and say what might fall into being transferable skills uh, between a hockey shot and a golf shot. So uh, in your observation plan or your intake form, you know, you might want to consider okay, if the person says uh, they've had 10 years of golf experience. Is this going to have a significant impact on their hockey shot? Okay, this is an example. Okay. Great. So this is kind of a fun activity you can do uh, yourself or, or just as a bit of a thought experiment. I definitely suggest you pause and try it out yourself a little bit. Uh, I'll play the video for a little while. Um, and you should get a pretty good idea of what's going on fairly quick. Uh, but what I'd like you to do with this uh, activity is take a look at the sport. It's called Bosa Ball. It's, uh, I, I believe it was made in Brazil and it kind of combines a few different things uh, like a trampoline, volleyball, um, and soccer. So it pulls all three sports kind of together. And yeah, it just looks like a blast to play. Uh, it's done on a team. Everyone takes turns as, as um, uh, you know, you, you get the uh, score points and, and such. But uh, what I'd like you to do is look at the sport. No, you most likely haven't ever seen it before. And I want you to go through the process of maybe picking out, and we'll just focus on this main person here in the center. Um, uh, of, of the, the trampoline and try to figure out what sort of phases of movement they do and um, you know you can even do it rough and quickly it doesn't have to be uh, perfect and then develop a little bit of an SOS right and as you go through that process for an SOS you know what sort of things are you seeing with the total body movement for each phase what sort of pelvis or trunk of uh, use are you seeing as far as force production or, or shifting of that? Is there changes in the base of support and what's going on with the extremities, okay? So I'll play it. And then again, while, um, yeah, I'll let it play for a bit and then you can pause it and I'll, I'll just go through a few points as the video plays after, okay? Okay, so let's go for it. Again, super fun uh, sport. Get 
So again, while you're looking, just try to keep an eye on that center player on the trampoline. Again, can you use your feet or your hands. About three times before you gotta get the ball over. And then... There's different points as to whether it lands and goes out based on the, the gray ring or the red ring as well. Good, so I think you got the idea there. So as far as phases and critical features, well, you know, we have someone jumping on the trampoline and then doing a volleyball spike, essentially, right? So, you know, you can have some phase starting with um, the bound up on the trampoline, so some sort of a jump, and then more or less you just get into the timing, the phases of a prep, force production, follow through, like critical instant follow through as far as a volleyball serve, right? Recovery landing onto the trampoline. Okay, so there's about six phases in there, roughly. For each of those, you know, we can look at the total body, even as the whole movement, as our first initial observation, right? So if we're watching this, we're gonna watch the jumping. Yeah, there's some sort of timing and rhythmicity with the bouncing, a little soccer kick there. So that would be potentially a style or a different form of the cert. But I can see the rhythmicity, I can see um, timing and general um, flow as far as, as the server or the, the main center player is, is performing. Generally, the pelvis, trunk, and large muscle groups are, are focused on um, bounding, so that's the jumping component. And then obviously, the, there's a change in how that support happens. There's not really much of a support, per se, when you're in the fl in flight, right? As when you're in projectile motion, there's nothing to produce force off of. So that would happen at the trampoline itself. And then, of course, the specific extremity actions that happens at the end. So at that point in time, you're observing the, the spike or the kick over the, over the net. Okay, and so that's just kind of a systematic way that we've observed this movement. We started out with just generally what's going on with the movement and what we, we kind of see. What's happening at the hips and larger muscle groups, so in this case, the lower body. And then, yeah the specific actions at the extremities that help this movement uh, be completed, right? Okay, great. So, yeah, that's just give you a bit of an idea of how you might start applying or going through a systematic approach from the perspective as a coach, if you're given that, those sort of steps and instructions to do, okay? Great. So, just to summarize, one slide, bring it all together for you, whole thing, you're going to take home one slide, make it this one, um, is you want to focus your attention on critical features in whatever phase they happen to be in. Okay, And, and so that, again, is the first step that you really need to, to try to uh, hammer out at this point in time. The second part of it, exercise as much control over the observational situation environment as possible. Okay, this one's tricky because the more lab-based or clinic-based that you get with your observation strategy, the more challenging it is to ref, uh, infer or, or to transfer, transfer your uh, observations to a real game, okay? Now, sometimes that's okay. Um, sometimes in a, a performance-based setting, um, let's say, say someone's uh, used to playing in front of a really large crowd, okay? When you go to observe or video or record uh, them perform this skill, they'll probably be more adept and more comfortable with being filmed if they do this in front of a large group of people typically uh, versus someone who, who hasn't really had that experience, okay? But that being said, you know, um, my example with the football field, you wanna try to control how much you view because you need to see the whole mo uh, motor skill without too much interference from other players, uh, fans, uh, etc. Co other coaches may be getting in the way, right? Okay. Number three, you want to plan angle of views and vantage points. Well, that kind of comes into play there, but again, want to be a little specific about it. <clears throat> uh, 
and four, you want to plan the number of observations that occur. Okay, I spoke about that. And last but not least, decide if extended observation is needed. Again, not not always. I know it's very intuitive as as athletes and people in a technologically uh, uh, convenient world that you know if we can video it, just video it. But uh, that's always. Uh, not necessarily provides more information. So be sure to justify any of your choices uh, they make for your SOS. Okay, great. The moment we've been waiting for, what do you do for your own data collection? Great. First of all, we need to come up with a plan, right? Um, yeah, so let's say it go, uh, go at this. So the first thing you wanna do before you even start the plan itself uh, is be very clear and very specific about the movement's goal. Okay, so the movement goal will help indicate the critical features that you need to use. Okay, so how many critical features? Well, I suggest up to three. Okay, <clears throat> so that means you can have some less or some more, but ultimately you want to get up to at most three for, for this project. Okay. If you can, try to identify about one per phase. So that might be more than three, but the idea is you start trying to figure out uh, one per phase, then you hone in on the most important phases and you look for commonalities across each phase about similar features that, that might be the same over multiple phases. And then that should be a good indication that if um, uh, uh, the amount of uh, arm arm swing or range of motion of, of hip uh, movement is, is important across three of your six phases, it's probably a critical feature, right? So again, try to keep that in mind. And then once you have your critical features sorted out, you can then start deciding on the best metric that you want to measure or obtain for each critical feature in, in the different phases. And what is the best way to measure that? Okay, so we did this activity last day in class, but just to review again and have it here for your reference, you know, you start with your phases. This is just kind of a random made up kind of uh, movement that I had in my head. It was actually a component of a movement, but so you have your phases. So we have a prep, a force production and a recovery phase. Um, and we've decided that our critical features, the main one for each is leg up and back fully in the prep phase. The force production phase is uh, the leg swinging through at a high velocity, you know, kind of picturing like a kicking motion. And then the recovery is the leg just returns to resting position. It's important. It's a critical feature of this, act, you know, whatever movement this is. Okay, so the metrics that we want to uh, identify for each critical feature here is, well, the leg position. We said that's really important. During force production, it's a leg moving at high velocity. So it's the rate of change of that leg position and that includes a shift of weight. And then here in the recovery, it's this, the leg returning to position. So, so the position's the important part, okay? So how do you capture position? Well, motion capture, okay? That's probably the easiest, best way that you know how to do this. Um, how do we capture range of change of position or rate of change of position and a shift of weight? Well, we can use motion capture for that. It's really great for a rate of change. But uh, force plate is really great for a shift of position. Um, and then I included EMG question mark here. So again, um, you know, if you're wondering to yourself, you know, what, what sort of measurements do we need to do in lab? Um, how many, et cetera? This, is, this process is gonna help you. But, um, and I know you haven't done lab three yet, uh, which will include this, but you know, force production. Well, how do you know what muscles are working when and producing force or energy? Well, like we covered in our big three uh, measures uh, or qu quantitative measures to gather for studying human movement, it's EMG, right? So you, you, have, you know about all three of these and you know the information it can provide for you. So, you know, really, really starting through all of that. And I also heavily hinted at all three of these come together to provide human movement quite quite well and quite complete okay so um, again if you're you're struggling to decide whether you need something or not refer back to the goal of the movement the critical feature 
and know at the end of the day all three of these together help explain human movement really well okay and the last one position and motion capture so again if we kind of look across all of these different phases and metrics and stuff we see position comes up a lot and probably the most common motion capture what is for sure the number one thing i'm going to do with this movement motion capture okay i'm going to measure for position rate of change uh, between positions uh, maybe uh, angle joint angles as well that'll help tell me um, uh, what's going on when I measure and in particular when I measure a successful movement to a not successful movement okay I'm gonna have to divide those two um, trials and data collection apart from one another okay <clears throat> Okay, so we, we, we kind of got that sorted out. Uh, you went through this process and you determined what you want to measure. Great. Got your desired metrics. You got your critical features. You know the methods as to what you want to measure and how you want to measure. So now you're ready to create your lab plan. Okay. And so first, it's just like planning, planning a trip, you know, or planning any, anything really. A recipe, how to, how to cook, right? So first of all, we need the setup. Um, what do you need to be in place and what information do you need to have before you literally start measuring and collecting data? So that can look like any number of things. It can be um, collecting info from your participant and or participants. It can be ensuring all the lab equipment is there, present and operational. Okay, so maybe a couple of little test trials of each piece of equipment. You might need to run a quick demo of um, how do you collect two or three pieces of of um, uh, data at the same time, you know? Uh, do, you, do you need Brian there? How many group members do you need there? Who, where do you set up cameras? Are you recording that everything, right? So just thinking ahead of time of all, all your pieces of equipment and uh, yeah, what, what, like um, uh, people that you need in place in order to collect your data, okay? Then actually plan out the collection itself. So I, I kind of said it for the setup as well, but ultimately the, one of the more challenging parts of this is how will you collect multiple forms of data to pull together? Well, this goes back to one of the first labs when we we're talking, or like the big three lab, when we were speaking about how do you integrate uh, different, different measures? Well, it's time, right? So you need to make sure that you're able to time and landmark everything, every trial at the same point if you're collecting multiple data points for that same trial. Okay, so if you have EMG and force plate, are your trial timers starting and finishing at the same time? You know, are you going to be able to align at 10 milliseconds or 30 milliseconds or whatever the case is that at your critical instant? you see both a spike in the force plate as well as a spike in your AMG, right? So figuring out how that's gonna work logistically is one of the, the hardest, but probably the most important part about your data methods and your data collection, okay? So it really, really, really pays off to, and it's a huge time saver, saver for yourselves, to walk through the process in your head, figure out how that's gonna look, write it down, chat with your, your partners, um, and determine how that's going to look and how that's going to flow best. Okay. Because once you get in there, you know, your, your time there is meant to just collect the data versus figure out what to do. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's the big ticket item here and what you'll really need to plan for. And, and, um, you know, Ryan and myself, will we'll definitely be able to help you, uh, guide you there. But uh, I'm going to strongly suggest that you don't just come up to us and be like, I don't know what to do. What I want to encourage you to do is here is what we thought of so far. Here is what we've looked up, researched, determined. Here's, here's what some st other studies have done as far as their methodology and how they set up their data collection. Um, how, how is this looking? So, so come, come to us with some legwork and some, um, that's already been done and, and we'll, we'll try to guide you one way or another. Okay. The goal is to facilitate this, um, and not just give you the answers. Right. Okay. So 
The last part of the data collection is how will you keep your data organized? Uh, I kind of spoke to that before, but uh, the big take home here and something that some students miss fairly often is, um, you know, you run 10 trials, okay? And let's say the goal is uh, to score a goal. So let's say hockey and you have your net and you have a target because when you're playing hockey, the goal of say a shot is to uh, quickly and accurately hit a certain target in the goal. So get it in the net. Um, when you do your 10 trials, let's say someone scored or hit the target eight out of 10 times. Okay, great. What you need to do is be able to organize and successfully and, and migrate out the successful trials from the not successful trials, okay? Because this is gonna help tell you what your critical features are and what your degrees of correctness are, right? So if on um, your eight trials that this person happened to successfully score a goal, they happen to be, uh, you know, they actually slowed down the speed at which their shot was occurring, uh, their trunk rotation was occurring, or slowed down the amount of uh, transfer of weight between their legs, or, or whatever the metric is that you've noticed that's changed. Well, that might be different than the part the times that they didn't get it, which maybe they're moving too quick and shifted their weight too early or something like that, right? Okay, so if that's the case, then uh, you need to be able to plan ahead to organize how to separate that data collection, okay? And that's that's a little easier than, than that first one, okay? Okay, so this will look very different for everyone in different groups. Everyone has a different level of um, organization that they, they like to keep and have. So again, um, this will, will look a little unique to everyone, okay? But definitely have something, okay? And, and my, my tip or cue is you wanna have it clear enough that you could potentially hand it to someone that has never seen uh, your plan before and be able to continue uh, to conduct it, okay? But ultimately this is for yourselves to do and to have, okay? Great, so on that note, <laughs> Here we are. Uh, critical features, go back to it. Reassess, refine, um, you know, take some new considerations, some new points of research that you've collected, integrate that. Um, yeah, maybe after you've done your, your mapping out of uh, the different phases and different, um, uh, yeah, again, critical features you wanna look at, uh, maybe that'll, that'll change a few things here for you. Uh, two, keep up that research. So keep diving into the literature and, and use things and keep track of it for Simon 2, but also for yourself as far as um, how different methods are, are being done. For example, if you found a really good um, uh, textbook or, or piece of literature that says, here's the best critical features for this, great, cite it, use it. But they might have already done a very similar collection of data that you might want to reproduce and do in the lab for yourselves. Um, so they might have some methodology for you to, to look at and include in your lab plan, your data collection plan, okay? Once uh, you've kind of done these two features again, and maybe it's it's been an ongoing process for you, so you feel pretty comfortable where that's at, that's when you do those last few slides that we just covered. So get into your lab, lab uh, methodology plan or your lab data collection plan. Uh, and like I said, make sure it's 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 to a level of un, uh, clarity that anyone can pick it up and, and be able to re reproduce that. Um, that'll set you up well. And then last but not least, uh, your observation plan for your QMD. Now, the way this will work is a bit more of an ev ev um, evolving process. So again, you're gonna have more depth and knowledge about your critical features as you go on through your project. And also, once you get to the end of your data collection, so your actual data collection, you'll have a good idea of the critical features. So you'll re-finalize re them. And through that, you'll be able to have a very clear instruction and strategy for coaches or movement practitioners to view your movement, okay? Great. 
Okay, so yeah, with that being said, that's kind of what you're off to and the, the stage you're at now. So definitely a few things to work on. Um, but here's a sample of uh, part two QMD, just so you can have it in your mind, uh, what it'll end up looking like sort of. You're gonna have a schematic because, you know, as a movement practitioner, it's very easy to be able to see a well-labeled and diagrammed schematic. So in this particular skill for gait analysis for uh, someone with a stroke, you know, I want to have my force plate here. I'm in a clinic, so I can have all this uh, at my disposal. I have my two two cameras. Here's my mover. You know, they're going to walk across the camera this direction, or maybe they just walk, uh, walked away. But um, I have everything very specific how, how it's laid out. So I could give that to anyone. They could be like, yeah, okay, we'll set up our, our studio or our lab or our clinic exactly like this. Okay. Then you'll also want to be specific as far as where you place your markers for any motion capture you do. Um, and I, I highly, highly suggest you, you need markers if you're going to do any motion capture for your research component. Here, because it's a clinical setting versus, say, in a gym or a, a field or something like that, we can have uh, markers. Um, probably wouldn't be this many. But, um, but definitely in a field or a sporting situation, you might not have as many markers, but you'd want to explain why. Um, you can speak about the frame rate you want. So this looks like a um, um, pretty standard frame rate, uh, about 24 frames per second. Uh, then, you know, speak about your methods for data collection. So this, so being in the clinic and being part of your SOS, this would be for, say, a physiotherapist. And they'd be looking at this and you say, okay, first up, you want to set up your cameras. You position them that far from the uh, force plate. Then you want to have instruct the client to walk from A to B using a, um, a slower or a medium pace, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that'd be for, for that. But then again, with physiotherapy, maybe you don't have all that lab equipment and you'll need a second uh, SOS. And in that case, you know, you could explain how you might just want to observe how people, uh, how their gait uh, works when you don't have any of the other equipment. So you would say your field of view is here. You want to see them walk this distance this many times. You're looking for X, Y, and Z sort of thing, okay, uh, as far as critical features. Okay, okay and that's, that's the sample there. Um, yeah, again, uh, here's your kind of uh, what to do next. Big key factor trying to drive it home is critical features at this point in time. Once you hash that out, again, you can go through the chart, figure out what metrics you want to measure based off of your critical features and how and then therefore how you want to measure them. OK. OK, thank you all for for taking a view here. Um, and and hopefully you're you're keeping well. Uh, good luck with your your projects here, and have fun in in lab.